Hey, welcome to the Fan Cave. So on the last episode, I was talking about psychopaths and how you can spot one from the outside uh, using the Clown Prince of Crime as our example. But what's going on on the inside? What makes somebody a psychopath? So that's what this episode is all about. We're going to look at their genes, their hormones, their brain structure, and how all of those things interact with their environment to make them that way. So uh, psychology, it's still really primitive. Stay skeptical, but if you're hungry, Alfred made some cucumber sandwiches, so buckle up, let's crack the case. Psychopathy runs in families, and it correlates between twins, which is pretty good evidence that it's genetic. Now, before you go jump into the conclusion that this means it's somehow like evolutionarily advantageous or something, keep in mind that there are tons of genetic diseases. Evolution is blind, and so are you, if you have any of the 350 different genetic hereditary eye diseases. So I don't want to hear anything about how psychopaths are just the head of the curve. Even if you control for things like poverty and abuse and all of that, violent offenders are much more likely to have some sort of mutation with their MAWA uh, gene. This is the gene that encodes for monoamine oxidase A. So what that MAO do? Well, it's a flava enzyme. So that means it helps digest, so to speak, the leftover neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, noradrenaline, and serotonin. If psychopaths have all this stuff, these uh, excess neurotransmitters clogging everything up in their brain, you would think that would make them more emotional, right? But think of it this way, if all the phone lines are busy, nobody's getting through. Get a wrong number. Leave your message at the sound of the shriek. No, please. Ah! This makes sense because normal people, when you show them a really gory photo, you can measure their displeasure. You can measure it in their heart rate, their eye contact, their galvanic skin response. Uh, in a psychopath, all that stuff stays pretty steady. In fact, it's likely that they are extra enthralled and interested in really gory images. Maybe, and I'm just speculating, maybe this has something to do with like needing a really loud noise to cut through how noisy it is in their brain all the time. So in the last video, I was talking about how violent impulsivity is a key hallmark of a psychopath. I found this study about some researchers who they had accidentally bred mutant mice who were psychopaths. And the mice were totally normal, they just had that mutation on their MAOA gene that made them really predatory and they would attack other mice without any reason. Why is it that some children who are abused grow up to be abusers and some don't? Obviously human behavior is really complicated, there are a lot of factors, but multiple studies have found that the ones who grow up to perpetuate abuse tend to have the MAOA gene that is associated with aggression. And the ones who don't, don't. But plenty of people with this mutation to their MAOA gene uh, don't end up being psychopaths. It's just one piece of the puzzle we're putting together here. But if this person has the long allele of the serotonin transporter gene, then there's an even higher risk that you're gonna be dealing with a psychopath. So if you're into neuroscience at all, you might have heard that the short allele of the serotonin transporter gene is responsible for an increased risk in things like depression, anxiety, other sort of maladaptive stress responses. The long allele version kind of does the opposite. It still messes with the person's stress response, but in a different way. People who have this, they don't really have much of a startle response, which is another key trait of a psychopath. <laughs> the 
the hypothesis is that maybe this is why they're not really able to learn a connection between someone else's suffering and like, stop, don't do that. Uh, they're just indifferent. Again, not everybody with a long allele is a psychopath, it just increases the risk. And I really have to emphasize that genes are not destiny. Your environment can influence which genes get switched on or off. There's just so much more to it. We're not gonna talk about epigenetics right now. I'm gonna move up from genes to hormones. So there was an experiment where they had people do speeches in front of a crowd that was heckling them. Those people were getting their cortisol levels measured. Cortisol is a stress hormone. The short allele people, the ones at risk for depression and anxiety, when they got heckled, their cortisol levels went way up. The long allele people, their cortisol levels basically stayed the same. They were not emotionally threatened by a very hostile crowd, which kind of makes sense because another key trait of being a psychopath is having such a grandiose sense of self that you don't really care what other people think of you. You're fearless in that way. And this is why I think that Donald Trump is not really a psychopath. I think that he is a narcissist because I think he has a genuine insecurity and pettiness and need to be liked. My hands are too big. The other hormone that correlates a lot with psychopathy is testosterone. By far the first risk factor in being a psychopath is just being a man. Across all cultures, men commit way more violent acts than women. Uh, there are female psychopaths, but they tend to have really high testosterone. In experiments, if you give people, men or women, testosterone, it changes their risk reward behavior. They tend to take more risks and care a little bit less about consequences. Here's why this makes sense. In a normal person's brain, the cortisol counteracts testosterone in a way. But if the cortisol isn't really hooked up right in a psychopath's brain, you get all that risk taking and aggression and stuff like that. So we talked about genes and hormones and those two things drive how a baby's brain develops. So if the baby has the long allele for the serotonin transporter gene, that's gonna screw up serotonin transportation in their brain. So a lot of that wiring that's supposed to happen just doesn't. For example, you can look at psychopaths' brain scans and you can see a visible disconnect between the amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. There's not as much white matter where there should be, there's not as much functional connectivity. And so why is that important? Well, the amygdala, that's like the first emotion center of your brain. It's the fight or flight place. It, it just has a quick reaction and then it broadcasts that emotional response to the rest of the brain. The ventromedial prefrontal cortex, it's supposed to receive that signal and then choose the appropriate behavioral response. That's the part of your brain that's really responsible for like moral reasoning, handling self-control. So in a psychopath, if the amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex are not really communicating, they don't have that little voice in their head saying, mm, maybe I shouldn't do this. Related, your brain has a little oops alarm that goes off when you realize that you've made a mistake. And you can detect that with an EEG scan. It's an electrical pulse originating in the anterior cingulate cortex. And if somebody's doing math problems and they realize, ooh, I just did that one wrong, you see this little blip coming from that part of the brain. But in psychopaths, they don't really have that. So they don't really feel regret. They don't really feel remorse. Which brings me to the big one empathy. The defining trait of a psychopath is a total lack of empathy. This part's a little controversial. Mirror neurons, uh, maybe you've heard of them. The basic premise is if I see somebody else get hit in the nuts, my brain would light up in some of the same places it would if I got hit in the nuts. So that wince, that like, ooh, uh, that sphincter tightening feeling, psychopaths don't experience that at all. The wires are just not connected. So most of our theory of mind stuff happens in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, the moral reasoning part happens specifically in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the orbital frontal cortex. Which brings me to Jimmy <laughs> Fallon. Different Jimmy Fallon. This one is a neuroscientist and a professor at UC Irvine. And he was looking at brain scans and he came across one with some weird activity in the orbital frontal cortex. And he thought, this matches the brain scans I've seen of murderers. And he dug into it and he found out it was his. It got mixed in with all the others. Then I started talking to my family. I said, just tell me the truth. And then my closest friends, but everybody 
started to tell me the same thing. It started talking about that I wasn't there, that the love they gave to me was never returned in that way. So you spend time, but you're not there. And, and the psychiatrist who knew me said, Jim, we've been telling you, you're a psychopath for years, you just don't listen. And I went, what are you, what, what the, you know, I, I said, what are you talking about? I said, it's a joke. You're crazy. I'm not. No, I'm not. Lizzie Borden was a famous case in the late 19th century. She was well known for chopping up her parents, mother and father, took an ax and uh, killed them. She was a cousin of ours, so this is this whole dark history of uh, violence and murder in her family. There were seven more men on my father's side that were all murderers. As it turns out, I have uh, the brain pattern of, of a psychopath. I've got the genes, like all of them, that would make me a very violent, dangerous person. But that doesn't mean somebody with this pattern where the frontal lobe, the orbital cortex turned off, is gonna be a killer. It means that they're gonna have a, probably a flat emotional affect, they're gonna be superficially charming. Usually risk takers, which I am, bon vivants, which I am, can be clowns, which I am. So why did Professor Jimmy Fallon never attack anybody? He thinks it's because he had pretty healthy upbringing and really supportive family members. And yeah, that is an important mystery to solve. Like if psychopaths really do make up 1% of all people, why are 1% of people not murderers, right? It must be because somebody somewhere is doing something right. Despite all of the genes and hormones and brain structure issues, somebody's figuring out a way to change the environmental conditions so that these people grow up relatively harmless. They're overriding all of that nature with nurture. But there's one last little paradox. If psychopaths are totally lacking in empathy, if they can't put themselves in another person's shoes, then how is it that they're so good at manipulating people? Maybe the answer is that they can turn their empathy on or off. The consensus for decades has been that psychopaths are permanently unempathetic. And that's how I felt when I made the last Fansplainer video about the psychopath test. But since then, I came across a study. It's pretty similar to a lot of studies where they have normals and psychopaths look at gory images and measure their brain activity and stuff. But in this experiment, they put the psychopath through a second round and they asked the psychopaths to make a conscious effort to empathize with the victims. And then their brain scans came out indistinguishable from normal people's. You can lie to a researcher, but it's pretty hard to fool an fMRI machine. This is weird, right? It, it means there's some fluidity to the brain that we don't really understand yet. None of this research was able to cure any of these psychopaths, but I believe whatever doesn't cure you simply, simply makes, makes you... Stranger. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch. Comment, like it, you can dislike it. You can leave a mean comment, I'm still probably gonna reply. You can share this video, and if you want more Fansplainer episodes, subscribe. Thanks.